Satan Considering the Saints. It was first preached on April 9th in the year 1865 by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. The text for this sermon was taken from the book of Job, Job chapter 1, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? How very uncertain are all worldly things. How foolish would that believer be who would lay up his treasure anywhere except in heaven. Job's prosperity promised as much stability as anything can do beneath the moon. That man had around him a large household of faithful and devoted servants. He had accumulated wealth of a kind which does not suddenly depreciate in value. He had oxen and donkeys and cattle. He did not have to go to markets and fairs and trade with his goods to procure food and clothing, for he carried on the processes of agriculture on a very large scale all around his own homestead, and probably grew within his own territory everything that his establishment required. His children were numerous enough to promise a long line of descendants. His prosperity lacked nothing. It had come to its highest level, and there was nothing that could cause it to fall. Up there, beyond the clouds, where no human eye could see, there was a scene enacted which predicted trouble for Job's prosperity. The spirit of evil stood face to face with the infinite spirit of all good. An extraordinary conversation took place between these two beings. When called to account for his doings, the evil one boasted that he had been roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it, insinuating that he had met no resistance to his will and found no one to oppose his freely moving and acting at his own pleasure. He had marched everywhere like a king in his dominions, unhindered and unchallenged. When the great God reminded him that there was at least one place among men where he had no foothold and where his power was unrecognized, namely in the heart of Job, that there was a man, one man, who stood like an impregnable castle, garrisoned by integrity and held with perfect loyalty as the possession of the King of Heaven. The evil one then challenged Jehovah to try the faithfulness of Job. He told God that the patriarch's integrity was due to his prosperity, that he served God and avoided evil because of sinister motives, because he found his conduct profitable to himself. The God of heaven took up the challenge of the evil one and gave him permission to take away all the mercies which he had affirmed to be the props of Job's integrity and to pull down all the fortifications and defenses and see whether the tower would not stand in its own inherent strength without them. In consequence of this, all Job's wealth was destroyed in one black day, and not even a child was left to whisper comfort. A second interview between the Lord and his fallen angel took place. Job was again the subject of conversation, and the Great One challenged by Satan permitted him even to strike his flesh and bones till the prince became worse than a pauper, and he who was rich and happy was poor and wretched, filled with disease from head to foot and was willing to scrape himself with a broken piece of pottery to gain a little relief from his pain. Let us see in this the uncertainty of all earthly things. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. This is David's description of this world. And if it is founded on the seas, then is it any wonder that it changes so often? Do not put your trust in anything beneath the stars. Remember that change is written on the forehead of nature. Therefore do not say, My mountain stands firm, it shall never be moved. The glance of Jehovah's eyes can shake your mountain into dust. The touch of his foot can make it like Sinai, 
to melt like wax and to become nothing but smoke. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and let your heart and your treasure be where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. The words of Bernard can instruct us here. Listen to what he said. The truest and chief joy is not conjured up from the creature, but received from the Creator. And once we have received it, no one can take it from us. This true joy from God makes all earthly and worldly pleasures to be nothing but torments. All joy is grief. Sweet things are bitter. All glory is baseless. And all delectable things are despicable. This is not, however, our subject this morning but only an introduction to our main discourse. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Let us consider then first in what sense the evil spirit may be said to consider the people of God. Secondly, let us notice what it is that he considers about them. And then thirdly, let us comfort ourselves by the reflection that one who is far above Satan considers us in a higher sense. First, then in what sense may Satan be said to consider the people of God? Certainly not in the usual biblical meaning of the term consider. O oh Lord, consider my trouble, consider my meditation. Blessed is he that considers the poor. Such consideration implies goodwill and a careful inspection of the object of benevolence with the intention of giving help and kindness. In that sense, Satan never considers anyone. If he has any benevolence, it must be towards himself. But all his considerations of other creatures are of the most malicious kind. No sudden flash of good ever darts across the black midnight of his soul nor does he consider us as we are told to consider the works of God, that is, in order to derive instruction as to God's wisdom and love and kindness. Satan does not honor God by what he sees in his works or in his people. It is not within him to go to the ant and to consider its ways and be wise. Rather, Satan goes to the Christian and considers his ways and becomes more foolishly God's enemy than he was before. The consideration which Satan gives to God's saints is this. He regards them with wonder when he considers the difference between them and himself. A traitor, when he knows the thorough wickedness and the blackness of his own heart, cannot help but be astounded when he is forced to believe that another man is faithful to his country. The natural thought of a treacherous heart is to believe that all men are just as treacherous and are really just the same as they. The traitor thinks that all men are traitors like himself or would be if it paid them better than loyalty. When Satan looks at the Christian and finds him faithful to God and to his truth, he considers them as we should consider a phenomenon perhaps despising him for his folly, but yet marveling at him and wondering how he can act that way. I, he seems to say, a prince, a peer of God's parliament, would not submit my will to Jehovah. I thought it better to reign in hell than serve him in heaven. I did not stay in my position of authority, but fell from my throne. How is it that these Christians can stand? What grace is it which keeps these Christians faithful? I was a vessel of gold, and yet I was broken. These are earthen vessels, but I cannot break them. I could not stand in my glory. What is the matchless grace which upholds them in their poverty, in their obscurity, in their persecution, still faithful to God who does not bless and exalt them as he did me? It may be that he also wonders at their happiness. He feels within himself a seething sea of misery. 
There is a deep gulf of anguish within his soul. And when he looks at believers, he sees them quiet in their souls, full of peace and happiness, and often without any outward means by which they should be comforted, yet rejoicing and full of glory. He goes back and forth through the world and possesses great power, and there are many faithful followers who carry out his orders without question in order to serve him. Yet he does not have the happiness of spirit possessed by the humble Christian woman, obscure, unknown, having no servants to wait upon her, but stretched out upon the bed of weakness. Satan admires and hates the peace which reigns in the believer's soul. But his consideration may go further than this. Is it not possible that Satan considers the Christians to detect, if possible, any flaw and fault in them, which would bring some comfort to himself? They are not pure, he says, these blood-bought ones, these elect from before the foundations of the world, they still sin. These adopted children of God even offend the glorious Son who bowed his head and gave up his spirit for them. How must he chuckle with such delight as he is capable of over the secret sins of God's people. And if he can see anything in them inconsistent with their profession, anything which appears to be deceitful, and therein like himself, he rejoices. Each sin born in the believer's heart cries to Satan, My father! My father! And he feels something like the joy of fatherhood as he sees his fond offspring. He looks at the old man and the Christian and admires the stubbornness with which it maintains its hold, the force and the passion with which it struggles for the mastery, the craft and cunning with which every now and then, at set intervals, at convenient opportunities, it puts forth all of its force. He considers our sinful flesh and makes it one of the books which he diligently reads. I don't doubt that one of the fairest prospects which the devil's eye is always fixed upon is the inconsistency and the impurity which he can discover in the true child of God. In this respect, Satan had very little to consider in God's true servant, Job. Nor is this all, but rather just the starting point of his consideration. We don't doubt that he views the Lord's people, and especially the more eminent and excellent among them, as the great barriers to the progress of his kingdom. Just as the engineer, endeavoring to build a railway, keeps his eye very much fixed on the hills and the rivers, and especially on the great mountain through which it will take many years of labor to bore a tunnel. So Satan in looking on his various plans to carry on his dominion in the world, considers most such men as Job. Satan must have thought a lot about Martin Luther. I could control most of the world, he says, if it were not for Luther. He stands in my way. That strong-headed man hates and mauls my firstborn son, the Pope. If I could get rid of him, I would not mind, though 50,000 smaller saints stood in my way. Satan is sure to consider God's servant Job, since God said, There is no one on earth like him. For he stands out distinct and separate from his fellow men. Those of us who are called to the work of the ministry must expect from our position to be the special objects of Satan's consideration. When the binoculars are put to the eyes of that dreadful warrior, he is sure to look out for those who by their uniforms and insignia are discovered to be the officers. And he tells his sharpshooters to take careful aim at these. For, he says, if the one who carries the standard should fall, then shall the victory be more swiftly gained to our side, and our opponents shall quickly retreat. If you are more generous than other saints, if you live nearer to God than others, as the birds peck most at the ripest fruit, 
so may you expect Satan to be most busy against you. Who cares to fight over a country that is covered with stones and barren rocks and ice bound by frozen seas? But at all times, there is sure to be fighting over the fat valleys where the fields of good wheat are plenteous and where the farmer's toil is well rewarded. And thus, for you who honor God most, Satan will struggle very strongly against you. He wants to pluck God's jewels from his crown, if he can, and take the Redeemer's precious stones even from the breastplate itself. He considers then God's people, viewing them as hindrances to his reign. He contrives methods by which he may remove them out of his way or turn them to his own advantage. Darkness would cover the earth if he could blow out all the lights. There would be no fruit to shake like Lebanon if he could destroy that handful of corn on the top of the mountains. Hence his perpetual consideration is to cause the faithful children of God to fail. It needs very little wisdom to discern that the great object of Satan in considering God's people is to do them injury, is to do them injury. I hardly think he hopes to destroy the really chosen and blood-bought heirs of life. My notion is that he is too smart for that. He has been foiled too often when he has attacked God's people, that he can hardly think he will be able to destroy the elect. For you remember the mystics and the seers who are very much related to him. When they spoke to Haman, they said this, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Satan knows very well that there is a royal seed in the land, against whom he fights against in vain. And it strikes me if he could be absolutely certain that any particular soul was chosen by God, he would scarcely waste his time in attempting to destroy it, although he might seek to worry and dishonor it. It is, however, most likely that Satan no more knows who God's elect are than we do, for he can only judge as we do by outward actions. Though he can form a more accurate judgment than we can through longer experience and being able to see the person in private where we cannot intrude. Yet into God's secret book of life, the black eye of Satan can never peer. By their fruits he knows them, and we know them in the same manner. Since, however, we are often mistaken in our judgment, he too may be mistaken. And it seems to me that he therefore makes it his policy to endeavor to destroy all of them, not knowing in which case he may succeed. He goes about seeking whomever he may devour, and since he does not know whom he may be permitted to swallow up, he attacks all the people of God with vehemence. Someone may say, how can one devil do this? He does not do it all by himself. I do not know that many of us have ever been tempted directly by Satan. We may not be notable enough among men to be worth his trouble, but he has a whole host of inferior spirits under his supremacy and under his control. And as the centurion says of himself, so Satan might also have said about his control, over the demons. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say do this, and he does it. Thus all the servants of God will more or less come under the direct or indirect assaults of the great enemy of souls, and that with a view of destroying them, for he would, if it were possible, deceive the very elect. Where Satan cannot destroy, there is no doubt that his object is to cause worry. If he can't destroy us, he likes to cause us to worry. He does not like to see God's people happy. I believe the devil greatly delights in some ministers whose tendency in their preaching is to multiply and foster doubts and fears 
and grief and despondency as the evidences of God's people. Ah, says the devil, preach on, you are doing my work well, for I like to see God's people mournful. If I can make them hang their harps on the willow trees and go about with miserable faces, I think I have done my work very well. My dear friends, let us watch out for those temptations which pretend to make us humble, but really aim at making us unbelieving. Our God takes no delight in our suspicions and mistrust. See how he proves his love in the gift of his dear son Jesus. Get rid of all your doubts and fears and rejoice in unmoved confidence. God delights to be worshipped with joy. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise to him with psalms. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you are upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Satan does not like this. Martin Luther used to say, Let us sing psalms and spite the devil. And I have no doubt Martin Luther was pretty nearly right, for that lover of discord hates harmonious, joyful praise. Beloved brother, the archenemy wants to make your life wretched here on earth. If he cannot have you in eternity, and in this, no doubt he is aiming a blow at the honor of God. Satan is well aware that mournful Christians often dishonor the faithfulness of God by mistrusting it. And he thinks if he can worry us until we no longer believe in the faithfulness and goodness of our Lord, he shall have robbed God of his praise. He that offers praise glorifies me, says God. And so Satan lays the axe at the root of our praise, that God may cease to be glorified. Moreover, if Satan cannot destroy a Christian, how often has he spoiled his usefulness. How often has he spoiled the usefulness of a Christian? Many a believer has fallen, not to break his neck, that is impossible, but he has broken some important bone and has gone limping to his grave. We can recall with grief some men once eminent in the ranks of the church who did run well, but all of a sudden, through stress of temptation, they fell into sin, and their names were never mentioned in the church again, except with bated breath. Everybody thought and everybody hoped that they were saved, but certainly their former usefulness never could return. It is very easy to go back in the heavenly pilgrimage, but it is very hard to reverse your steps once you have stepped back. You may easily turn aside and put out your candle, but you cannot light it quite so easily. Friend, beloved in the Lord, watch against the attacks of Satan and stand firm, because you, as a pillar in the house of God, are very dear to us, and we cannot spare you. As a father or as a mature woman in our midst, we honor you, and oh, we would never want to be made to mourn and lament over you. We do not wish to be grieved by hearing the shouts of our adversaries while they cry, Aha! Aha! Just as we thought, you are not any different from us. It is sad, but there have been many things done in our Zion which we would not have told in Gath, nor published in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised should rejoice, and the sons of the Philistines should triumph. Oh, may God grant us grace as a church to stand against the tricks of Satan and his attacks, that having done his worst, he may gain no advantage over us. And after having considered and considered again and counted our towers and our walls, he may be compelled to retreat because his battering rams cannot jar so much as a single stone from our fortifications. 
and his slings cannot slay one single soldier on the walls. Before I leave this point, I would like to say that perhaps it may be suggested. How is it that God permits this constant and malicious consideration of his people by the evil one? How is it that God permits this constant and malicious consideration of his people by the evil one? Without a doubt, one answer is that God knows what is best for his own glory and that he gives us no explanation of his plans, that having permitted free agency and having allowed, for some mysterious reason, the existence of evil, it does not seem agreeable with his having done so to destroy Satan. But he gives him power that it may be a fair hand-to-hand -hand fight between sin and holiness, between grace and craftiness. Besides, do not forget that the temptations of Satan are of service to the people of God. It has been said that they are the file which rubs off much of the rust of self-confidence. And I may add that they are the horrible sound in the sentinel's ear which is sure to keep him awake. Another man of God has remarked, that there is no temptation in the world which is so bad as not being tempted at all. For to be tempted will tend to keep us awake, whereas without temptation the flesh and the blood are weak. And though the spirit may be willing, yet we may be found falling into a slumber. Children do not run away from their father's side when the big dogs bark at them. The howlings of the devil may tend to drive us nearer to Christ, may teach us our own weakness, may keep us on our own watchtower, and becomes the means of preservation from other evils. Let us be self-controlled and alert. Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And let us, who are in a prominent position, be permitted lovingly to press upon you one earnest request, namely, my brethren, that you pray for us, that since we are especially exposed to the consideration of Satan, that we may be guarded by divine power. Let us be made rich by your faithful prayers, so that we may be kept faithful even to the end. Secondly, what is it that Satan considers with a view to the injury of God's people? What is it that Satan considers with a view to the injury of God's people. It cannot be said of Satan, as of God, that he knows us completely. But since he has been dealing with poor, fallen humanity for over 10,000 years, he must have acquired a very vast experience in that time. And having been all over the earth, and having tempted the strongest and the weakest, he must know very well what the springs of human action are and how to play upon them. Satan watches and considers, first of all, our particular weaknesses. Satan watches and considers, first of all, our particular weaknesses. He looks us over, just as I have seen a horse dealer do with a horse, and soon finds out where our faults are. I, a common observer, might think the horse an exceedingly good one, as I see it running up and down the road, but the dealer sees what I cannot see, and he knows how to handle the creature in just the right way so that he can soon discover any hidden trouble. Satan knows how to look at us and quickly evaluate us, so that he will say of this man, his weakness is lust, or of the other, he has a quick temper, or of this other person, he is proud. Or of that other one, he is lazy. The eye of malice is very quick to perceive a weakness, and the hand of hostility soon takes advantage of it. When the arch enemy finds a weak place in the wall of our castle, he is careful to plant his battering ram there and begin his siege. You may conceal, even from your dearest friend, your weakness, but you will not conceal it from your worst enemy. He has the eyes of a wildcat, 
and detects in a moment the most vulnerable point on your body. He goes about with a lighted match, and though you may think you have covered all the gunpowder of your heart, he knows how to find a crack to put his match through. And he will. He will cause much trouble in your heart unless eternal mercy shall prevent it. Satan is also careful to consider our state of mind. Satan is careful to consider our state of mind. If the devil would attack us when our mind is in certain moods, we should be more than a match for him. He knows this and shuns the encounter. Some men are more ready for temptation when they are distressed and desponding. The fiend will assail them then. Others will be more liable for attack when they are jubilant and full of joy. Then will the evil one strike his spark into the tinder. Certain persons, when they are very upset and tossed to and fro, can be made to say almost anything. And others, when their souls are like perfectly placid waters, are just then in a condition to be navigated by the devil's vessel. As the worker in metal knows that one metal is to be worked at such a heat and another at a different temperature, as those who have to deal with chemicals know that at a certain heat one fluid will boil while another reaches the boiling point much earlier, so Satan knows exactly the temperature at which to work us for his purpose. Small pots boil quickly when they are put on the fire, and so little men of quick temper are soon in a passion. Larger vessels require more time and heat before they will boil. But when they do boil, it is quite a boil, not soon to be forgotten or abated. The enemy, like a fisherman, watches his fish, adapts his bait to his prey, and knows in what seasons and times the fish are most likely to bite. This hunter of souls comes upon us when we least expect it. And often we are overtaken in a fault and are caught in a trap through an unwatchful frame of mind. That rare collector of choice sayings, Thomas Spencer, has said this, listen. The chameleon, when he lies on the grass to catch flies and grasshoppers, takes on the color of the grass. Likewise, some creatures in the sea take on the color of the rocks under which they lurk that the fish may boldly come near them without any suspicion of danger. In like manner, Satan turns himself into that shape which we least fear, and sets before us such objects of temptations as are most agreeable to our natures, that some of us may soon be drawn into his net. Satan sails with every wind, and blows us that way which we are inclined through the weakness of our nature. Is our knowledge in matter of faith deficient? He tempts us to error. Is our conscience tender? He tempts us to legalism and too much preciseness. Has our conscience allowed some latitude? He tempts us to carnal liberty. Are we bold-spirited? He tempts us to presumption. Are we fearful and distrustful? He tempts us to desperation. Do we have a flexible disposition? He tempts us to infidelity. Are we stiff? He labors to make us obstinate heretics, schismatics, or rebels of us. Do we have a severe temper? He tempts us to cruelty. Are we soft and mild? He tempts us to indulgence and foolish pity. Are we hot in matters of religion? He tempts us to blind zeal and superstition. Are we cold? He tempts us to layer to sea in lukewarmness. Thus he lays his traps, that one way or another he may ensnare us. Satan is also careful to consider our position among men. Our position among men. There are a few persons who are most easily tempted when they are alone. They are the subjects then of great heaviness of mind, and they may be driven to the most awful crimes. Perhaps most of us are more liable to sin when we are in the company of others. 
In some company I would never be led into sin. Many are so full of flippancy and humor that those of us who are inclined the same way can scarcely look them in the face without feeling our besetting sin coming awake. And others are so somber that if they meet a brother from the same mold, they are pretty sure between them to invent an evil report of God's church or people. Satan knows where to overtake you. He knows in what place where you lie open for his attacks. He will pounce on you, swoop like a bird of prey from the sky, where he has been watching for the time to make his descent with a prospect of success. How, too, will Satan consider our condition in the world? He will consider our condition in the world. Satan looks at one man and says, That man has property. It is no use of my trying such and such tactics with him. But here is another man who is very poor. Ah, I will catch him in that net. Then again he looks at the poor man and says, Now I cannot tempt him to this folly, but I will lead the rich man into it. As the sportsman has a gun for the wild fowl and another for deer and game, so too Satan has a different temptation for various orders of men. I do not suppose that the queen's temptation will ever annoy Mary the kitchen maid. I do not suppose, on the other hand, that Mary's temptation will ever be very serious to me. Probably you could escape from mine. I do not think you could, for I sometimes fancy I could bear yours, though I question if I could. However, Satan knows just where to hit us, and our position, and our capabilities, our education, our standing in society, our calling, may all be doors to which he may attack us. You who have no calling at all are in a particular peril. I am amazed that the devil does not swallow you outright. The most likely man to go to hell is the man who has nothing to do on earth. I say that seriously. I believe that there cannot be a worse evil for a person than to be placed where he has no work. And if I should ever be in such a state, I would get employment at once, for I fear that I would be carried off, body and soul, by the evil one. Idle people tempt the devil to tempt them. Let us have something to do. Let us keep our minds occupied, for if not, we make room for the devil. Hard work will not make us gracious, but the lack of hard work may make us vicious. Have something always on the anvil or in the fire. In books or work or healthful play, I would be busy too. For Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. So as we were taught in our childhood, so let us believe in our manhood. The reading and studying of books or other works and exercise are necessary for health and should occupy our time. For if I allow myself to be lazy like an old piece of iron, I must not be surprised that I grow rusty with sin. Nor have I finished yet. Satan, when he makes his investigations, notices all the objects of our affection. He notices all the objects of our affections. I do not doubt when he went around Job's house. Satan observed it as carefully as thieves do a jeweler's premise when they plan to break into them. They very cunningly take account of every window, door, and lock. They do not fail to look at the house next door, for they may have to reach the treasure through the building which adjoins it. So when the devil went around, jotting down in his mind all of Job's wealth, he thought to himself, There are the camels and the oxen, the donkeys and the servants. Yes, I can use all of these very well. Then he thought to himself, There are the three daughters, there are the ten sons, and they go feasting. I know where to catch them, and if I can just blow the house down when they are feasting and partying, that will afflict the father's mind the more severely. For he will say, 
Oh, that they had died when they had been praying, rather than when they had been feasting and drinking wine. I will put that down, too, in my inventory of schemes. Then the devil said, I shall want her also, and accordingly it came to that. Nobody could have done what Job's wife did. None of the servants could have said that sad sentence so stingingly. Or if she meant it very kindly, none could have said it with such a fascinating air as Job's own wife when she said, Curse God and die. Ah, Satan, you have plowed with Job's heifer, but you have not succeeded. Job's strength lies in his God, not in his hair, or else you might have shaved his head just as Samson's head was shaved. Perhaps the evil one had even inspected Job's personal sensibilities and so selected that form of bodily affliction which he knew to be the most dreaded by his victim. Satan brought on Job a disease which Job may have seen and shuddered at in poor men outside the city gates. Brethren, Satan knows quite as much in regard to you too. You have a child, and Satan knows that you idolize it. Ah, he says, there is a place for wounding him. Even your brother and sister may be made a quiver in which hell's arrows shall be stored till the time may come, and then Satan will shoot them at you for his advantage. Watch even your neighbor and also she that lies in your arms. For you do not know how Satan may get an advantage over you. Our habits, our joys, our sorrows, our havens, our public positions, all may be made weapons of attack by this desperate foe of the Lord's people. We have snares everywhere, in our bed and at our table, in our house and in the street. There are snares and traps in the company of others. There are also pits when we are alone. We may find temptations when in church as well as in the world. Traps in our pride and deadly poisons in our humiliation. We must not expect to be free from temptations until we have crossed the Jordan. And then thank God we are beyond gunshot of the enemy. The last howling of the dog of hell will be heard as we descend into the cold waters of the black stream. But when we hear the hallelujah of the glorified, we shall be done with the black prince forever and ever. Satan considered, but there was a higher consideration which overrode his consideration. There was a higher consideration which overrode its consideration. In times of war, the mine layers of one party will dig and plant mines to destroy the enemy fortresses. And it is very common for the mine layers of the other party to countermine by undermining the first mine. This is just what God does with Satan. Satan is planting a mine, and he thinks he will light the fuse and blow up God's building. But all the while, God is undermining him. And he blows up Satan's mind before he can do any mischief. The devil is the greatest of all fools. He has more knowledge but less wisdom than any other creature. He is more subtle than all the beasts of the field. But it is well called subtlety, not wisdom. It is not true wisdom. It is only another form of folly. All the while that Satan was tempting Job, little did he know that he was answering God's purpose. For God was watching and considering the whole thing, and holding the enemy as a man holds the horse by its bridle. The Lord had considered exactly how far he should let Satan go. He had considered exactly how far to let Satan go. He did not the first time permit Satan to touch his flesh. Perhaps that was more than Job at that time could have endured. Have you ever noticed that if you are in good, strong bodily health, you can bear losses and crosses 
and even bereavements with relative calmness? Now that was the case with Job. Perhaps if the disease had come first and the rest had followed, it might have been a temptation too heavy for him. But God, who knows just how far, just how far to let the enemy go, will say to him, This far you can go, and no further. By degrees he became accustomed to his poverty. In fact, the trial had lost all of his sting the moment Job said, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. That enemy was slain. No, it was buried, and that was the funeral sermon. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When the second trial came, the first trial had qualified Job to bear the second. It may be a more severe trial for a man in the possession of great worldly wealth suddenly to be deprived of the bodily power of enjoying it, than to lose everything first and then lose his health necessary to its enjoyment. Having already lost everything, he might also say, I thank God that I now have nothing to enjoy, and therefore the loss of the power to enjoy it is not so wearisome. I do not have to say how I wish I could go out into my fields and see my servants, for they are all dead. I do not wish to see my children. They are dead and gone. I am thankful that they are, for it is better than that they should see their poor father sit on a dunghill like this. He might also have been glad if his wife had gone too, for certainly she was not a very particular mercy when she was spared, and possibly if he had all his children about him, it might have been a harder trial than it was. The Lord who weighs mountains and scales had measured out his servant's woe. Did not the Lord also consider how he should sustain his servant under this trial? Did not the Lord also consider how he should sustain his servant under his trial? Beloved, you do not know how blessedly our God poured the secret oil on Job's fire of grace while the devil was throwing buckets of water on it. He said to himself, If Satan shall do much against him, then I will do more for him. If he takes much away, I will give him more. If he tempts Job to curse, I will fill him so full of love to me that he shall bless me. I will help him. I will strengthen him. Yes, I will uphold him with my right hand of righteousness. Christian, take those two thoughts and put them under your tongue as a wafer made with honey. You will never be tempted without express license from the throne where Jesus pleads. And on the other hand, when he permits it, he will, with the temptation, make a way of escape or give you the grace to stand up under it. In the next place, the Lord considered how to sanctify Job by his trial. How to sanctify Job by his trial. Job was a much better man at the end of the story than he was at the beginning. He was an incredible disgrace to Satan and his power. He was a perfect and an upright man, but at first there was a little pride about him. We are poor creatures to criticize such a man as Job, but still there was in him just a sprinkling of self-righteousness. I think his friends brought it out. Eliphaz and Zophar said such irritating things that poor Job could not help replying in strong terms about himself. And I think that they were rather too strong. There was a little too much self-justification. He was not proud, as some of us are, of a very little. He had much to be proud of, as the world would allow. But yet there was a tendency to be exalted with it. And though the devil did not know it, Perhaps, if he had left Job alone, that pride might have become a seed, and Job might have sinned, but he was in such a hurry that he would not let the small seed ripen, but hurried to cut it up, and so became the Lord's tool to bring Job into a more humble and consequently 
a more safe and blessed state of mind. Moreover, observe how Satan was an assistant to the Almighty. Satan was an assistant to the Almighty. Job, all this while, was being enabled to earn a greater reward. He was being enabled to earn a greater reward. All his prosperity is not enough. God loves Job so much that he intends to give him twice the property. He intends to give him his children again. He means to make him a more famous man than ever. A man whose name shall ring down through the ages. A man who shall be talked of throughout all generations. He is not to be the man of us, but the man of the whole world. He is not to be heard by a handful in one neighborhood, but all men are to hear of Job's patience in the hour of trial. Who is to do this? Who is to fashion the trumpet of fame through which Job's name is to be blown? The devil goes to the forge and works away with all of his might to make Job illustrious. Foolish devil, he is piling up a pedestal on which God will set his servant Job that he may be looked upon with wonder by all ages. To conclude, Job's afflictions and Job's patience have been a lasting blessing to God's holy church, and they have inflicted incredible, incredible disgrace upon Satan. If you want to make the devil angry, throw the story of Job into his teeth. If you desire to have your own confidence sustained, May God the Holy Spirit lead you into the patience of Job. Oh, how many saints have been comforted. How many have been comforted in their distress by this history of patience. How many have been saved out of the jaw of the lion and from the paw of the bear by the dark experiences of the patriarch of us. Oh, arch fiend, how you are trapped in your own net. You have thrown a stone which has fallen on your own head. You made a pit for Job, and you have fallen into it yourself. You are trapped in your own craftiness. Jehovah has made fools of the wise and driven the false teachers mad. Brethren, let us commit ourselves in faith to the care and the keeping of God. Let poverty come, sickness come, even death come, and we will in all things through Jesus Christ's blood, be conquerors. And by the power of his Spirit, we shall overcome in the end. I pray to God that we would all trust in Jesus. May those who have not trusted him be led to begin this very morning. And God shall have all the praise in us all evermore. Amen.
How many have been comforted in their distress by this history of patience? How many have been saved out of the jaw of the lion and from the paw of the bear by the dark experiences of the patriarchs above? Oh, arch fiend, how you are trapped in your own net. You have thrown a stone which has fallen on your own head. You made a pit for Job, and you have fallen into it yourself. You are trapped in your own craftiness. Jehovah has made fools of the wise and driven the false teachers mad. Brethren, let us commit ourselves in faith to the care and the keeping of God. Let poverty come, sickness come, even death come, and we will in all things through Jesus Christ's blood be conquerors. And by the power of his spirit, we shall overcome in the end. I pray to God that we would all trust in Jesus. May those who have not trusted him be led to begin this very morning. And God shall have all the praise in us all evermore. Amen.